So it's really great to be the last speaker of the day. Um, I promise I have no graphs or charts for you to digest. Um, just our story of our daughter's transition and some pictures to go along with it. Um, okay. There we go. Um, so as Holly said, this is the mission statement of the Tavon Center. Um, the Tavon Center is a program that we created back in 2003, um, and the reason for creation is our daughter, Saba. Saba was born 33 years ago with a developmental disability. Um, as she got to adulthood, we were really concerned about what she was gonna do. Um, we were very proactive parents, and we were very determined that she was gonna remain connected to her community. Um, she does not have autism. Um, she's a very social girl, but she's nonverbal and requires all, care for all activities of daily living. Um, so we were the perfect parents. We went through the whole person-centered plan in junior high and high school. We worked with the job vendors, um, and at graduation she had a job doing some paper shredding for a couple of half days a week. She had a part-time caregiver, and then I was working part-time as a nurse practitioner. And, um, well, no, it was a nurse at that time. Um, and so it was perfect. It was perfect for six weeks after graduation. And <laughs> after six weeks, um, she, my other daughter drove her to the shredding job and everybody was gone. And we were then informed she was too high needs to go off site with everybody else. So she lost her job. Um, the part-time caregiver was more attracted to the full-time job at Nordstrom. And so that left me, um, mother, which was not really a great uh, option for either her or I. As much as we love each other, no 21-year-old wants to be with their cranky aging mother all day long. So we had been thinking, we meaning my husband and I and our very large extended family about uh, starting a program for adults with disabilities because there really was nothing out there um, for her. We looked at what was available. There were a lot of geriatric day programs, but she was a 21-year-old girl who had just graduated from high school, and she likes music, she likes boys, um, she can bring a room together like nobody else and doesn't even need to say a word. Um, so going to be with a bunch of 70 and 80-year-olds listening to swing music was not really a great option for her. So this is what we felt like, like every other family that I still work with today. I'd like to say that, that things have changed since my daughter has graduated from high school, but, but parents still talk about that black hole because while well, services are better, they just haven't come along as, as quickly as they need to um, with people being in the community and institutions closing, which is great that they're doing that, but, but then, yes, let's close institutions, but then, you know, what next? You know, what, what kind of support are our families gonna be given to keep their sons or daughters at home and in the community? So we had a vision of creating a program that would continue to teach life skills, continue to teach vocational skills, and focus on socialization and recreation. Um, em employment was a big push then, it's gotten even bigger. Um, the reality for us parents is that if our children are employed, they're employed a couple hours a week, if we're lucky, and, and granted I'm talking about people who have pretty significant disabilities, um, and so, and even for people who, who are less significantly disabled, it, finding the jobs and, and maintaining the jobs is pretty tricky still. So we got everybody together in 2003. We started the nonprofit. We did a need survey for uh, within a 10 mile radius of the piece of property that we had. Um, we needed to raise money and apply for grants and build a facility, um, all the things that go into starting a brand new program. Um, you can see my dad here. He's scratching his head saying, what the hell is she doing now? <laughs> so. <laughs> Anyway, he was the business person behind it. I was the dreamer. I think one of the reasons we've been financially successful is because we've had business people on our board. And as good as a vision can be for a nonprofit, if you don't have money behind it, you're, you're not going to be able to be successful long term. So we tore down that little greenhouse and put everybody knew, that we knew to work. And basically, we went back to kind of that person-centered planning again, calling on everybody who cared about our daughter. 
Um, we had had people from all over the community coming. Uh, Tavon actually means ability in Farsi. My husband's Persian, and, and so he got his whole community to come and, and build the gardens and the house. Um, and this is the little greenhouse turned into this. This is our facility. We're located on six acres in Issaquah. We have a big focus on horticulture. The, the reason why we went down that path is because I tended to be outside quite a bit. My daughter was always with me. And the, the beauty of horticulture is that a task can be broken down to such very small increments that anybody can do at least a piece of the work. We opened uh, in 2008. Our program served three people, and Matt, who's waving there, actually works at Microsoft full time. He was at Tavon for two years, finally learned enough skills, um, and has been employed there for quite a while. So thank you guys for being so incredibly acceptable or accepting. Um, we now serve 65 people, so what was a little program for my daughter has become really big. We have a 20 person wait list and are, are needing to grow and just are in that process of thinking about how we can grow thoughtfully and keep that, the um, quality of our program and remain financially viable because growth in a nonprofit doesn't necessarily mean increased revenue. Um, as I said, we focus on horticulture. Um, we started out pretty small about a year and a half ago. We hired a farmer who um, graduated in sustainable agriculture. So she really took our gardens from being a hobby to being a, a more production type garden. And as you can see, this is Leah. I mean, everybody can do something. And we have a farmer's market stand. So we now harvest what we grow. And on Thursdays have a market stand down at Gilman Village in Issaquah. Everybody participates in that. So it's a great community connection. We also last year started a CSA, a delivery service of herbs and vegetables, which again, everybody gets to participate in. It's a great community connection. Um, and that was another thing that was really important to me with the programs were, well, the, the adult day programs were very center-based. Um, that wasn't, you know, obviously we needed a center, but keeping that connection to the community was really important for our family. Um, this is just a picture of everybody at the market stand. Um, we also have several volunteer sites. This is um, one of our members working at the food bank. We volunteer at Swedish Hospital. We volunteer at the library. We just got a new volunteer site at the new Y that opened up in Sammamish. So um, through these volunteer sites, people are able to learn vocational skills that ideally someday could be transitioned into um, employment. We teach a lot of life skills. Um, people are expected to participate however they can. Uh, lunch is included in our program, so people have to do menu planning, they have to go shopping, they have to learn how to manage their, the money when they go shopping, and then they get to do all the cooking as well and everybody eats together. Socialization, it, huge. Just having friends, remaining connected to your community um, it was just another really important thing for our family. Um, we have uh, two to one staffing, so two members to one staff. So we have a pretty personalized program, which really helps us tailor the program to people's abilities. Um, and recreation, remaining physically active, being in the healthcare field. I've seen how adults with disabilities so often are not active. They're, they eat poorly, they're at home, they don't exercise, and so we make sure that they get out every day um, and work or and, and recreate in some form. We have an aquatics program where people swim twice a week. Um, our property has trails through it that they walk through every day. Um, and so that's just a really very quick overview of the program that we started in our transition story. I'd like to say that there's tons of programs out there like this, but there, there really aren't. The need is huge um, to have programs that, that for people who can't work either full or, or part-time, that there's something else out there for people. Because if you look at the statistics of people who are employed, um, there, there's a lot of hours in the week that parents like myself, whose sons and daughters still live with them, have to, have to fill. And 
as a parent, we remain the social director of the, the young adult, and when there's nothing to direct them to, then you're the one doing that um, all the time and speaking from experience and being known as an aging caregiver, which I hate that term, but, but it's, it get, you get tired. And so, you, you know, people, you know, grieve their empty nest and we grieve that we'll never have one. Our choice is to keep our daughter home with us and someday have, hire a caregiver to come in. Um, but, but in the meantime, she needs to be with her friends as do, does, does every other young person with a developmental or intellectual disability. So there you go. Happy Friday. <laughs>